I think though that you know the, the idea, like Hambridge used to say, it's not like your the idea here is you know your 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 left brain and your right brain can work in consonance with one another. You can train your left brain to understand the mathematics, but again, it's reciprocity. You know, you activate, you, and, and that's the thing, like a, good, a, a scientist will tell you, you know, they'll spend a year or two, they'll analyze something, they'll think about it, they'll be, you know, you know, taking it apart and looking at it and putting it back together, and then at some point when they're least expecting it, usually when they're completely unprepared, they have the revelation. But in the revelation is a right brain phenomenon. But the right brain is finally responding to all of this left brain activity that, 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 that's been going on in the scientist's mind. And um, finally it's triggered this response. Because the brain is a whole system. It just happens to have two, sem two hemispheres to facilitate, I think, our survival in this world. It helps to be able to think things through uh, critically and know what, uh, what's safe and what's dangerous and what works and what doesn't work. Okay, so let's get to some of the slides here. All right, the great year of the world. There we see a little graphic demonstrating that processional cycle. This would represent the polar axis of the Earth and that's one full processional cycle. This is actually the Chandler wobble. We don't need to worry about that now. There's actually a smaller wobble superimposed upon the bigger one. It probably is just in there to add a little more variety to the whole thing. But, <laughs> but uh, yeah, that's called the Chandler wobble. And that's basically what you're seeing going on with this. Okay. So, I think somebody asked me in the break, you know, why were, were, were ancient people so interested in this whole doctrine of the world ages and the procession of the equinoxes and all of this. And uh, I think basically, the, if for no other reason, it's that there is, when we were talking about in the first half here, the, the uniformitarian view of the world is that everything happens very slowly, everything happens very uniformly. The pace of change that we have known during our lifetimes and during historical times represents in effect the the pace of all change through the geological history of the earth. Ancient peoples didn't believe that. Ancient peoples believed that there were periods within these cycles where change was accelerated exponentially, to use more modern phraseology for it. And it's interesting that modern science is coming to some of the same conclusions that ancient traditions have been telling us for centuries and centuries. And that is, is there is appear, apparently a cycle of catastrophes. And um, our civilization happens to be where it is right now because of where we are in the midst of the cycle of catastrophes. In the book of Job, we are told to speak to the earth, and it shall teach thee. And this has kind of been my byline for many years because I have been very, very interested in studying the earth and listening to what the earth has to say. And uh, some of that I'm going to be presenting to you. Again, the book of Revelations, and I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away. And I think this is referring really literally to the fact that not only allegorically and spiritually that a material world is given way to a spiritual world, but that, that literally the earth is, is periodically destroyed and renewed. That seems to be part of this ancient wisdom that's been passed down to us is this idea that the earth has been periodically destroyed and then renewed. 21st chapter of Revelations. The key to understanding the doctrine of world ages is embedded in the geometry of time. Now this is how a geologist looks at the ages of the earth and actually when you begin to study this, it, it, it's, there are a lot of interesting parallels between this and more traditional conceptions. Um, you know, according to the Vedas, uh, Maha Yuga, or uh, the Kalpa rather, the Kalpa was 4,320,000,000 years. 4,320,000,000 years. The modern estimate for the age of the Earth is just a little about 4.5 billion. So the, 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 the old Vedic conception of the age of the Earth um, is actually very close to the modern conception. Here we see several things. We see over on the left, we see Paleozoic, Mesozoic, and Cenozoic. 
Zoic means life, biological life. Paleo means old. Meso means middle, and seno means recent. So we have old life, middle life, recent life. And those are the eras. The eras are divided into periods, the periods into epochs. Where are we now on this? Well, we're right up here at the top, right up there. I don't know if you can read this from back there, but this we are in an epoch now called the Holocene, which is part of the Quaternary period, which is part of the Cenozoic era. Right? When were the dinosaurs? I heard somebody say Jurassic. How, what? <laughs> Um, you know, it is a fact, as most 12-year-old boys know, that the, most of the dinosaurs that were in Jurassic Park were actually Cretaceous dinosaurs. But we won't quibble about that. Um, yeah, the Mesozoic was the age of dinosaurs, and it ended right here. See this line here at 66.4? That separates the epochs, it separates the periods, and it separates the eras. So did something happen? What, what happened right here? Asteroid. Cataclysm. Cataclysm. A big one. A big, bad cataclysm happened right there. And the Cretaceous world was basically terminated. Suddenly and totally terminated. And then we were, went from the Cretaceous to the Tertiary. And then we went through these five epochs of the Tertiary. And then we went into the Pleistocene. Now notice the Holocene is 0 .01 million. That's 10,000 years. Now, if we go back 10,000 years, remember the Wheel of the Zodiac that I had? I think that might actually be the next slide. Let me see. Yeah. Okay. 10,000 years, we're right there. Okay, now interestingly, right here is where the modern geologist says this is the current, the Holocene Epoch, is from here down to here, 10,000 years. So there's a little link there between the traditional conception and the, the modern conception. Now if we back up, you'll notice that the Pleistocene is 1.6 million. So the Pleistocene was a whole lot longer than the Holocene. Okay? What differentiates the Pleistocene from the epoch before it called the Pliocene? Anybody know? Besides Rusty? Who said that? I say. You're exactly right. The Ice Age. How'd you know that? Good one. Not the, the, the Big Ice Age. There's a Little Ice Age and a Big Ice Age. The Pleistocene, whatever the date of the Pleistocene ends up being, it's when the first of the most recent series of Ice Ages began. And I say series because in other times, Back, uh, for example, there was a big ice age back here at the end of the Eocene. There was also a big ice age way back here in the Ordovician. How many of you remember that one? <laughs> it was cold. <laughs> <laughs> so supposedly about 1.6 million years ago, something triggered a series of ice ages. Those ice ages lasted for 1.6 million years, and then the last one ended, and now we've been in, a, in the Holocene. Now, if we go prior to the Pleistocene into the Pliocene, we're in a very warm world. In fact, during the end of the Pleistocene, there were hippos living in England. That shows you how much warmer it was. Um, sea level was, in some estimates, put at about 40 feet higher than it now is. So there have definitely been times in the past when there was global warming. In fact, there have been several episodes of pretty extreme global warming throughout the Pleistocene. But what seems to characterize the Pleistocene is this seesaw, back and forth from a glacial age to an interglacial age. We're now in an interglacial age. Okay? At the end of the last ice age, uh, the last ice age uh, was called the Wisconsin Ice Age, um, after the state named Wisconsin. The reason is, is because a lot of the effects of the last ice age have been studied in the state of Wisconsin. So Wisconsin gave its name to the last ice age. But as it turns out, when we begin looking at cycles of time as depicted in the traditional versions, and we compare those or contrast those to the modern versions, we find out that they're actually not that different. And uh, I could spend a lot of time on this because it's a very interesting thing, but I'm going to leave it for now, other than to say 
that throughout this, from, from the beginning, from the end of the, the Precambrian and the beginning of the Cambrian, there have been five great episodes of mass extinction where essentially the whole entire prevailing flora and fauna of the planet was, an, was wiped out only to be replaced by a com almost, almost completely different set of flora and fauna. The last great global mass extinction that involved a, uh, a significant percentage not only of species but genera as well was here. There was also a mass extinction that occurred at, between the Eocene and the Oligocene at about 36.6. How many years ago are you talking about uh, We're talking millions of years now. So the Eocene ended around 36.6. Now, it, interestingly, uh, um, paleontologists who had been studying this, how this whole thing came about was by studying life. And they would be, they would be looking at fossils and they would go, they'd be looking, studying a strat of rock and here were all of these different forms of animal and plant life, and then suddenly they end, and then perhaps 50% of them, or three quarters of them, or 90% of them are gone and replaced by new species. And that's how these boundaries were originally determined, but no one really knew what caused those boundaries, and they also didn't know what the duration of those boundaries were. We now know, or suspect very strongly, that the duration of those boundaries was very, very, very short. Okay. Um, like, for example, the, tradition, the, the transition from Cretaceous to Tertiary was always assumed to have taken several million years. And this, this is what they thought up to two, two to two and a half decades ago. Whereas now, the most recent research suggests that the transition was probably not more than a week. What? How long? A week. A week? A week. Now, that doesn't necessarily, I'm not meaning to imply by that that the new species appeared within a week. The new species didn't appear overnight, but what did terminate in a week was the entire previous order of things. Terminated in a week. Now, right here at the Eocene Oligocene, which had been noticed that it was one of the last great global turnovers of animal and plant life, uh, Again, they didn't know why. There was also associated with a, with a period of, of extreme cold that lasted perhaps tens of thousands of years. But um, what's been discovered now, this was actually discovered in the early 90s when they were actually drilling for oil or, or ex some kind of exploratory geophysical drilling in the, um, where the Potomac River, uh, Washington. Chesapeake, Chesapeake Bay. Bay, Chesapeake Bay, right, thanks. At the bottom of Chesapeake Bay, there's a great big Astrobleem. You heard that term before? No. Astrobleem means star wound. Star wound. Well, apparently 36.6 million years ago, a piece of a star, i.e. an asteroid or a comet, slammed into the earth, created a big hole in the ground. Subsequent erosion and sedimentation has essentially created the modern Chesapeake Bay around this big depression that was when it hit, it splashed molten material out over, across over the entire southeastern United States and down in Georgia along the fall line, Macon along that area where the Piedmont gives way to the coastal plain, the rock strata that was formed at the end of the Eocene is exposed. And if you go down there, you can find tektites, which is the crystallized, um, very elegant aerodynamic shaped things that, that, that rained back to earth after that huge impact. So uh, there's been a lot of changes throughout the history of the earth, but most people assume that, well, these are all changes, you know, who's going to, 65 million years ago, 36 million years ago, there was another, the biggest, most dramatic change in the history of the earth happened right here, 245. In fact, whatever happened then, it was so severe it almost sterilized the earth after the earth had gotten prolific with life during this period almost all life disappeared right here and no one knew why until recently they've begun to suspect because they found what appears to be a giant astrobleem on the bottom of the pacific ocean whose date is around 245 million years if this thing does in fact turn out to be an astrobleem then that pretty well is the smoking gun there was a, a an astrobleem found associated with the Cretaceous-Tertiary transition. Anybody know where that was found? 
No. Who said Yucatan? Yucatan. The Yucatan. It's right down there. It, it, it's on the. Uh, it's on the. Um, Half of it is on the Yucatan Peninsula, uh, goes up into the Gulf, and half of it's on the, the land proper. Um, I have a very interesting program just about that, and the fact that you know the Mayans built their cities over this buried astrobleam, and they performed rituals, which if you see the rituals are highly suggestive that they knew all about it, or at least knew a considerable amount concerning this catastrophic event. We, let us proceed on. So here is our zodiacal wheel. We've seen this. We've had our explanation with this, so I don't need to, to stay on this. Let's keep moving here. <clears throat> Here's the Aztec calendar, also representing a wheel of time. And just as in, in the uh, portal of judgment you have the four seasons, you have the same thing represented by these four figures here, which represent four ages of the world, which if you read the Mayan cosmology, each of those four ages was terminated by a great catastrophe. This is the Aztec calendar, but the Aztecs, most of their cosmological knowledge was derivative from the Mayans. So what we're seeing here is, is basically what was ultimately a Mayan tradition. And then whoever preceded the Mayans, whether it was the Toltecs or the Olmecs or somebody even more ancient than them. In Ezekiel, we find a very similar verse to what we find in the book of Revelations. Um, talking about, yeah, the four living creatures, um, face of a man, face of a lion, face of an ox, face of an eagle. So this is Old Testament now. This is an Old Testament prophet. The previous verse was New Testament prophet. So this is one of the key teachings I think that links Old and New Testament is this, this sort of this vision of this. Um, in this case, um, one of the ways they describe it, let's see here. Um, yeah, now I beheld the living creatures, behold one wheel upon the earth. The appearance of the wheels in their work was like unto the color of the barrel. And this is the key thing here. Their work was, as it were, a wheel in the middle of a wheel. That is subject to various interpretations, but one version of the interpretation could say essentially wheels within a wheel within a wheel. And I think this is an appropriate metaphor for, for time, is that the larger cycles of time encompass the smaller cycles of time. And wheels were frequently incorporated as metaphors for the passage of time. Somebody, I think Carlos, weren't we talking about the Sphinx on the break? <clears throat> and Carlos was pointing out that in mythology, the Sphinx is composed of four mythical creatures. And what are the four creatures? Eagle, the lion, ox. Man. Yeah, there they are. The, the, the same ones. The ones representing, as Bill pointed out earlier, the fixed signs of the zodiac. And as I'm emphasizing, it represents the four ages of the great year, which we saw in that in that zodiacal wheel represented by the cross and the sphinx is a to me is a very apt symbol for the cycles of time and what's involved with the changing of them probably most of you are familiar with the controversy surrounding the age of the sphinx basically it's it's a conclusion derived from the study of this limestone rock here which is that this is the backside of the sphinx which has been had the masonry restored. So this is not the original masonry, which to me is really pointless. I mean, really, all of the, all of the, the reconstructed masonry needs to be removed so we can have the original body of the Sphinx. However, what's good about the way the Sphinx is is that the Sphinx is actually you know, quarried out of the living limestone. It was not a sculpture placed upon the land or upon the rock. The surrounding rock was removed to expose the body of the Sphinx. This originally would have been a quarry wall with the typical stepped profile that you see in all limestone and sandstone quarries. But it's been highly eroded by what force of nature? Water. Water, Water. yes. And modern Egyptology has tried their best to ignore this and explain it away. And, and to me, the more they try to explain it away, the more they shoot themselves in the foot because they can't explain it away. It is clearly, like Robert Schock has said repeatedly, it's a textbook case of water erosion. And of course, 
that represents a lot of water erosion, right, what you're seeing right there. So when was the last time that heavy rains fell in Egypt? It was underwater. What, Marty? At least 10,000. You're right, at least 10,000. In fact, uh, several of the studies have suggested that the rains fell over a period of about 2,000 years, bracketed precisely by the age of Leo, and probably ending around 10,000 years ago when the zodiacal, when the vernal equinox shifted from Leo to Cancer. We'll go on here because we'll run out of time. Um, Hamlet's Mill, which if you, if you want a book to study, that's a good one. Uh, the whole book is devoted to the notion that ancient cultures encoded their knowledge of precession of the equinoxes. And in this book, the authors are pointing out that the equinoctial points, and therefore the solstitial ones too, do not remain forever where they should in order to make celestial goings on easier to understand. <laughs> Namely at the same spot with respect to the sphere, sphere of fixed stars. Instead they stubbornly move along the ecliptic in the opposite direction to the yearly course of the sun. That is against the right or proper sequence of the zodiacal signs. This phenomenon is called precession of the equinoxes <laughs> And it was conceived as causing the rise and the cataclysmic fall of ages of the world. Essentially, the whole book is premised upon that conclusion. It's about a five or six hundred page book. And here we see, in reference to the Greeks, um, the Greeks still had the old idea, but they asked themselves questions about it. What moved was the sky. But questions about the sky posed obtuse problems. The greatest of, was, of course, the slow motion of the tilt of the, the sky described above, which went through a great year of 26,000 years. This is frequently the, the, the term used for the processional cycle is the great year. Okay. I'm going to skip through some of this. It's all good stuff. But, okay, here we go. Um, the angle through which the equinoxes move each year, the annual procession, is 1 26,000th of 360 degrees, which works out to be, as it says there, about 50 seconds, 50 seconds of arc. Each year as the sun completes its eastward revolution about the sky with respect to, say, the vernal equinox, that equinox has moved westward to meet the sun about 50 seconds. Now there are 60 seconds of arc in a minute. The distance across the full lunar disk during a full moon is about 30 minutes. So if you take the distance across the full moon, divide it by 30, the distance that the vernal equinox moves in the course of a year is a little bit less than that. In fact, it's been said by some commentator years and years ago that that distance is just about the distance, the minimum distance necessary to be visible in, in the course of one human lifetime. Of, of astute observation. So it's not something that you notice from year to year, but what that means is that from our vantage point, as we watch the sun moving through the signs, it'll hit that point where at that exact point, day and night are exactly the same length. Well, if we do that from year to year and we go out the next year, what we'll see is the sun's going to get to that point a little bit sooner. And then the next year, a little bit sooner still. And then the next year, still a little bit sooner. In fact, what we're going to see is that over a span of about an average span of a, of a human life, about 72 years, it will move one degree. So I, interestingly, there's a correlation here. When you think of the great year, the great year, and we think of that as an analog of our annual year, one human life span is one day of the great year. I mean, the mathematics is pretty exact. That's how you could think of it. Think of, think of how one day is to our annual year. Today, this day, May 20th, 2006. From now till May 20th, 2007, as this day is to this next year, your life is to the great year. See, it's all analogous. And that's one of, the, to me, the principal insights that we gain from this study is that the big is reflected in the small. Scale and variance, I heard somebody say it, yes. One full cycle of precession contains 360 degrees of arc. Each degree contains 60 minutes of arc. Now you'll notice the, 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 the terminology used, we're talking about arc, 
which is a measure of circular space, but some of the terminology is the same as we use to measure time, right? We have 60 minutes of time in an hour and 60 seconds. What we're essentially saying is we take an hour and we divide it into 60 minute parts, hence a minute. And then we take one of those minute parts and we divide it into a second order of minuteness. And hence we get seconds, see? Seconds means second order of minuteness. The minute means that first order of minuteness. Uh, since Earth's axial precession shifts at a rate of 50 seconds of arc per year, and since there are a total of 1,296,000 seconds of arc in a full cycle, it follows that a full processional cycle takes that number, 1,296,000 divided by 50 years to complete, or, and when you do that, you'll get that, the magic number 25,920 that we saw earlier. Here's a diagram showing the geometric relations Celestial equator, which is just Earth's equator projected out into the cosmic vault, the plane of the ecliptic, with it, which is Earth's orbital plane, and here is the line of intersection of those two. Those points of intersection are the vernal equinox and the fall equinox. And it's when the sun, on its journey around the ecliptic, hits that point, the day and night are of equal duration. The period of light is 12 hours, the period of dark is 12 hours. Okay? And so what happens is as the Earth is swinging around, those points of intersection are rotating around. Yes? Um, I that, there, that the North Pole was migrating? The magnetic North Pole. Yeah, magnetic North Pole. Yes, it is. Um, well, it is migrating. Yeah, I think what's happening there is that, you know, the magnetic pole and the pole of rotation are not the same. The pole of rotation can be defined with geometric precision. The magnetic pole is, is, is different. And actually, most globes will have the magnetic pole shown, and it isn't on... I don't know if this one does. Most of them do. I can't find it. But both the North Magnetic Pole and the South Magnetic Pole do not coincide with the geographic pole or the axis of spin. It appears, though, that they're both migrating towards. So if nothing comes along to upset the balance, I would guess that eventually magnetic fields will realign with the axis of spin. And then magnetic pole and geographic pole will coincide. But right now they don't. I think the magnetic pole is nearly a thousand miles off the North Pole. And plus the magnetic field varies from location to location. That's why you always have, you have to make adjustments in your compass because you don't read true north except in a few places. Yes? I understand that airline pilots are having to adjust their uh, computations every week. Every week? I haven't heard that, but I, I guess it could be that fast. Yeah, I guess it could. Well, it could. Now, see, I have a suspicion that the last, that the, um, the discrepancy between geographic pole and magnetic pole perhaps goes back to the last cataclysm. Because one of the things that appears to have accompanied the last cataclysm is a repositioning of the geographic poles. And we may have time to talk about that today. This represents a view of well, here's, here's where we are right now, with the North Pole pointing in the sky to the star, almost to the star Polaris. Actually, here's where we are right now, that little hash mark. And because of the processional motion, that little hash mark is moving. So in about a century or two, we're going to get as close to Polaris as we're going to get in the whole cycle. And then we're going to start moving away from it. And then there's not going to be a prominent pole star right on, the, on this cycle Pretty much, well, when we get to Vega, Vega was the pole star you can see back during the age of Leo. Now, if we take, if we take a, uh, uh, in mapping of the celestial sphere, what they do is they have to project the celestial vault onto a flat plane. And, of course, you get some distortion in there. 
But if we take a map of the heavenly vault now, and then from 12,000 years ago, and we superimpose them, we get an image that looks like this. And you can see their overlap creates a beautiful vesica. And so I find that, that the, 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 the link there between the vesica and the ex, the, any two extremes of the processional cycle is, is very interesting to me. Here's another version of it where we're seeing the belt of the zodiac and then we're seeing the celestial equator and here's the earth. So as the earth is doing this, this disk of the equator is following in its wake and so it's this point here, these two points that are moving around. And this is the cosmic clock. And the idea is, is that there are stations in that, in that wheel that are significant, where the potential for something happening is intensified or enhanced over the normal background. And it seems if we read the ancient traditions literally, those four stations coincide with those four seasons, represented by the bull, the lion, the eagle, and the man. So here I put some dates on the thing, and you know, this is where we're at now, zero, and this is also where we were, where we were at 25,920 years ago. And as we go back to the beginning of the modern era and the beginning of the modern calendar, we're right here on the cusp of Aries and Pisces. And when we go back to 4320, that's the, the termination of the Taurian Age. Um, when we shift back through the Taurian Age, the main significance of the Taurian Age was is that that's where we essentially see the beginning of modern recorded history, Taurian Age. We push back, and then we're in the age of Gemini, then the age of Cancer, and then we're in the age of Leo. Age of Cancer and Gemini is what's generally considered to be the age of the goddess. When many of the archetypes, archetypal images from old Europe were of the, of the goddess images. And those, those go back to this period, what was being known as the Mesolithic, uh, the Middle Stone Age. Paleolithic goes back here. Neolithic is here. This is Neolith Neolithic is here, Mesolithic is here, Paleolithic is back here. In a lot of the older books, they were willing to acknowledge and say and admit that there was a great dividing line between the Paleolithic and the Mesolithic. The amount of ice on the earth was about three times greater. And then it began warming, it began to warm in here between the ages of, of Libra and uh, Virgo. So it warmed up in here, and then it suddenly got really cold again, and I'm going to actually show you a graph showing the, the climate changes during this period, which is very interesting. But coming out of the age of Leo was a very balmy climate. This was referred to as the hypsothermal time in here, and it was actually warmer. The earth was substantially warmer than it is now. Some estimates are the sea level was somewhere between 10 and 30 feet higher than it now is, depending on where the studies were done. And um, was interesting because a lot of when you look at a lot of the mountains around, particularly like in Peru, that had um, you know agriculture going on at 12,000, 13,000 feet. That was that was going back to this balmy time here, um, due to the increased temperature. The, the the agricultural the latitudes of the agricultural belt shifted north. Uh, the growing season was longer. The uh, the the elevation above sea level uh, was higher. What happened between here and here is that the climate cooled off by a couple of degrees and it forced a major disruption in human settlement patterns that had become established in these two ages right here. And it's interesting that this is where we see the first rise of cities and where we first see the first evidence of, of human strife in the form of implements of war. As you'll see, coming out of the age of Leo, um, it's highly likely that the human population numbers were reduced dramatically. So coming out of the age of Leo, the one thing that was in abundance here was territory and a, and a sparse human population. And we also had a very balmy climate uh, with a long growing season, like I say. When we get to the age of Taurus, we see that there's a shift. Not anywhere near as dramatic as here, but it's still it was dramatic in terms of what it did to human human pa patterns of human settlement. 
because what happened is some settlements, human communities were displaced and forced to move and then they then had conflict with other human communities that, that were already in those locations. And then it warmed up again. And actually we'll see that there's been a seesaw of the climate back through this whole, this whole time. And I'm going to show you the graph here coming up in a minute. There are many ways that this doctrine of the world ages has been embedded in various symbolic systems. The Tarot deck is a very interesting exposition of, this, of these concepts, I believe. I've chosen this one particular card because it seems to exemplify the, the principle more, uh, you know, more prominently than many of the others. Of course, we see the same effigies, which is a carryover from the medieval times. We see the wheels within the wheels. We see the Typhon dragon, we see the Sphinx, and we see a serpent, all associated, as we'll find out, with, with this concept of the changing world ages. I don't know if you know the myth of Typhon in, in Egyptian mythology, or I mean uh, Greek mythology. Typhon was the counterpart of Set. There was a great battle between Horus and Set. Its counterpart in the Greek mythos was the battle between Zeus and Typhon. And Typhon was always depicted as a fire-breathing dragon coming down and hurling rocks at the earth and breathing fire on the earth. That may have not just been allegorical. It may have actually been a memory of real events that might have happened. Yes, question? Yes, Zechariah Sitchin uh, is speaking in October. Mm -hmm. That might be interesting to some of us. Yeah, and, and, and I, I recommend Sitchin with a caveat in that I think that some of the stuff he did was great, and then I think that some of the other stuff, I think the evidence doesn't support. But I, I still think he's worth reading just for the ideas that he brings out and so forth. Um, how much time are we going to... I thought we just started. <laughs> All right, well, I better hurry up here then. Well, if we do end up doing class, then this will be all of the stuff that we, uh, that we cover in class. Um, it deals with the um, ancient you know, numerology and how it relates to the, the time cycles and so forth.